On behalf of SUNY IT faculty, staff, and students, uh, welcome to SUNY IT and our first nanotechnology forum. It is our hope that this forum and future such events will continue to support our nanotechnology vision for the Mohawk Valley. We're very glad that you're here uh, to join us in this important discussion about nanotechnology in our region. Before we get our general program started, I would like to uh, ask uh, several very important dignitaries to uh, uh, say a few words. First, we have with us our Congressman Richard Hanna, representing the 24th District, and as you know, he is a tireless advocate of education and technology. He is a member of three very important committees affecting our region. They are House Committee on Education and Workforce, which he had brought one of the uh, field hearing events to, uh, to our region uh, last year. He is also a member of House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and House Committee on Small Business. So please welcome our Congressman, Richard Hanna. Treasury, right? It costs some money. It doesn't. It's free. Now, 
I'll tell you why it's free. Those people pay taxes in there. Those people contribute. It actually does a lot of things. It grows the middle class. It educates us and allows us to compete. It takes away that kind of palm, pall that's over us now. You feel like this country's going backwards and people have lost direction and hope and enthusiasm. Uh, it's education that'll put that back. It's not sitting around and waiting for the government to find ways to put people back to work for 10 to $20 an hour. Not that there's anything particular <coughs> wrong with that, but it's not gonna provide those things that, that uh, ensure what historically has been a middle class survival and living in this country, a standard of living that up until recently has been um, the most competitive, uh, the, the highest standard in the world. And um, it still is by and large, but it's changing quickly. And we've got 24 million people out of work, not 13. A lot of people underemployed and under, unemployed. So that's one of the things I'm doing, and I'm on the STEM council down there. And, um, uh, there there's, that's, that's what I focus on right now. And I, I, I'd ask you, if you see that, come across your desk, we'll, we'll <coughs> take a look at it, see what you think. Any other educators, or if you got some ideas, stay in touch with us, because uh, uh, I'm getting some traction on, on it. I'm actually, uh, a guy named Steve Israel, who's head of the Democratic Party, is one of my personal friends, and he and I are working on it together. Uh, Ms. Gildebrand and I are working on it together. And, um, <coughs> it's, it's one thing to talk about what we all know, it's, but it's like an echo chamber in a room like this. You all know it. You know it better than anybody. So how do you, how do you move that idea outside of a building like this? Um, you do it by making it affordable. And in Congress, that's one of the things that we can work on. So I guess I, I don't have a lot to say about it other than I'd like your, your help, your ideas. And if you see it hit the floor, we're going to try to go out nationally. I know I can't sell it in Congress because Congress scores things not with an eye to the future, but, but almost looking straight down. The Congressional Budget Office, you know how they do it. Uh, it's black and white numbers, money in, garbage in, garbage out. and. Uh, but this is a real investment that pays for itself. So I applaud you for being here. I mean, I, uh, and I, I would like, I'm on education and workforce, and we have a new education bill. Uh, I could talk about that forever, but uh, I'll tell you what's wrong with the bill. Uh, from my side, we created this. There's no testing in it for science. You take testing out of science, out of, high school, out of K through 12, you've taken accountability out. And uh, I'm pushing back on my own party to put science back into the ed workforce, uh, back into the education for the uh, new ESEA, uh, if you know what that is, and uh, Secondary Education uh, Act. If you could, uh, if you see that, you can write a letter, I'd appreciate it, because I think it's, it's a really, really, really short-sighted. It's one thing to turn over to the states, your responsibility is another another matter to make sure that that responsibility is met and testing does that. So, thank you. Thank you, Congress. So representing the New York State District 47 since, the, since 2007, Senator Joe Griffo has been a staunch supporter of SUNY IT and the Mohawk Valley. In the New York State Senate, he chairs the Banks Committee and is a member of several important committees including Higher Education, Commerce, Economic Development, and Small Business, among others. So please welcome our friend, New York State Senator Joe Griffo.
to help, to do what we can to provide, not only the bricks and mortar, but to make this area site ready, shovel ready, to be prepared to deal with the new industry and the need for the 21st century. We recognize that that will require significant education and education and training to develop a workforce that can meet the needs with energy and focus uh, on issues such as nanotechnology. And that's why today we have all of you here, your commitment, your interest, and your willingness to continue to be partners uh, with SUNY IT and this region in our efforts will be very important and meaningful as we move forward. So there's much to do. We have achieved some. We will continue to reach further. Uh, we will need everyone working together. I do believe we have a lot of excellent people that are working on this. The Congress made some great uh, points upon STEM and, and really what can and will be done ultimately at the federal and even at the state level. So thank you for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Ye, for your leadership and for all the efforts uh, here at SUNY IT. We look forward to making this transformational experience happen in this economy because this will be something that will truly revitalize and revive this area. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Griffo. Although he is a uh, freshman assemblyman in the 2012 legisla legislative session, Assemblyman Anthony Brindisi has delivered for SUNY IT and the Mohawk Valley the resources and commitment like a senior assemblyman. He's also a member of several important committees critical to the region, including commerce and industry, energy, higher education, among others. So please welcome our Assemblyman Anthony Brindisi. I think the, uh, Senator Griffin was just saying the glasses and the gray hair make me the senior assemblyman, but other than that, uh, I'm still, still a freshman. But I, I want to thank you all for, for inviting me here. Thank you, Dr. Ye, to this, this very important forum. I'd also, also like to thank all of you who are in attendance today. Your attendance speaks volumes about how important nanotechnology is to our region and why we must continue to work to move things forward. Uh, the Mohawk Valley has the potential to become a leader in nanotechnology following in the footsteps of CNSE in Albany. Since taking office, I've been working closely with President Ye to make sure things keep moving in the right direction here. That's why when he brought up the idea of increasing staff and course offerings in the STEM fields at SUNY IT, I made it one of my top priorities for this year's state budget, and I'm, I was pleased to see that we were able to secure $500,000 in this year's state budget to help attract top-notch staff and build upon the courses currently offered here. The new staff and course offerings will help the students become more well-rounded in emerging technologies. One of the things businesses look for when relocating or when they are just starting up is a well-educated workforce. Just like Albany, the Mohawk Valley will become known as a place that turns out a highly skilled workforce which will help attract businesses and create more job opportunities for, the, for our children so they won't be forced to leave our area to find a good paying job. So I would like to thank President Ye and his staff for their leadership, and I look forward to working with them in the future to move our region and our economy forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assemblyman Bundisi, for your remarks. So in the audience, who has an iPhone? Okay. 4S? Okay. All right. And who's still on BlackBerry? Okay. That seems like so long ago, right? <laughs> right? So um, the question is, what's the big, I big fuss about nano? Uh, ever since the mankind has been on this planet, we've all always worked to control nature, but we haven't really mastered it. Mother Nature really uh, smacks us quite often. And from the discovery of fire to the present day nano gadgets that we all carry around, mankind has worked to manipulate the matter all around us. Starting around 2.5 billion BC, and fast forward through the current uh, day, also through the Bronze Age of 3300 BC, the vast majority of technologies we depend on our everyday life right now have been, has been uh, they have been discovered uh, within the last 100 years. Remember that in the 1950s, only 60 or so years ago, Crick and Watson 
figured out the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, the bl blueprint for life. The electronic numerical integrator and computer, also known as ENIAC, was the first computer, which was uh, built in 1946. And at that time, it had 17,468 vacuum tubes, 7,200 crystal diodes, 1,500 relays, and 70,000 transistors. And was about, it filled a, uh, a small house, uh, about 1,800 square feet in size, and it weighed about 30 tons, equivalent to an empty box uh, railroad car. Your present day average PC, or the iPad that you currently carry around, uh, count, can, can count numbers 14,000 times faster than ENIAC of 1946. So roughly 70 million calculations uh, per second versus 5,000 calculations that ENIAC did way back when. So in all, we have come a long way. I wanna show you a little bit of demo. Attached to this card, there are several transistors. Transistors are really the building blocks of all modern electronics, including our cell phones, as they're used for amplification and switching of signals. I wasn't able to find vacuum tubes in our labs. Uh, I think we've gone a little bit uh, further than that, so, but I was able to find some uh, transistors uh, for historical purposes. And the first generation transistor you see up here, they were about 1950s. Second generation transistor, these are all single transistors, uh, 1960s, and the later generations, 1970s, you know, you're looking at multiple transistors on a single chip. In 2008, Intel Corporation announced that it's quad core, so you hear about these quad core machines for your Macs and PCs, those quad cores, that would pack, take a guess, how many transistors in a, on a single chip? two billion transistors on a single chip. So technology advances in nano have been exponential. We have learned to manipulate matter uh, at the nano scale. We're continuing to exploit materials, processes, and technologies in even smaller scale than ever before. The world is getting flatter, but also very smaller, very, very small than ever before. Nanoscale science and technology have created new devices, gadgets that we live by, and they have also resulted in jobs and opportunities. The growth that we have witnessed in the capital region through dramatic expansion of College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering, or CNSE, is a testament of this new uh, burgeoning opportunity in nano. New York loves nanotechnology, and it shows. First though, to begin our conversation, I would like to introduce Michael Fancher. He is the Vice President for Small Business Development and Outreach at CNSC. And he will share with us the relevance and impact of nanotechnology to our region and New York State. Mike is no stranger to our region. He uh, was uh, instrumental in brokering our relationship with CNSC and New York State. In addition to his, his executive role at CNSC, he's also a faculty member in nanoeconomics at UAlbany. I don't know what that means, whether he, they deal with small monies or billions of uh, monies on a, uh, on a single check. But he was the dep also deputy du budget director of the New York State Ways and Means Committee prior to his taking on his current role at CNSC. He's also a CPA, so uh, make sure things are getting done appropriately. Uh, among his other many experiences and talents. So please welcome CNSC's Vice President for Business Development and Economics Outreach, Mr. Michael Fancher. Well, I see I've got a few extra minutes. So uh, with that in mind, um, I wish I knew uh, Wolf's comments beforehand because I had actually taken out a few slides that um, uh, spoke to, oh, yeah, th this spoke to this very progression in uh, computational capabilities, if you will. And uh, to kind of give you a flavor of nanoeconomics, maybe I'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, when you look back over kind of the history or the progression um, of the computer, 
it really started in 1908 when Lee DeForest um, uh, invented the tri triode tube. And um, I think it was uh, about within the next 10 years, uh, two gentlemen, Abramoff and uh, Isaacs, I think from Ohio State, developed the first mechanical computer. Okay, so it was a ma machine that kind of clunked away. Now, things kind of clicked along, and then in about 1946, the, that triode tube that Lee DeForest had invented had finally been turned into what we now called, or what they then called, the vacuum tube. And then with that, the um, government and its defense lab used the vacuum tube to create the ENIAC. And the reason they used it was to uh, be able to uh, target the trajectory of artillery. So, the, so far, so you had the first invention happen in academia. You had the next iteration happening in, in, in kind of in isolation in a government lab. Now, at the same time, about two years after the INAC was pr uh, developed, uh, Bell Labs developed the first integrated circuit. And if I had my slides, you would see this very crude piece of silicon with some wires kind of coming off of it, like a little shape of a triangle, and that was making a circuit. So Bell Labs, kind of a, an industry lab, very famous actually, and the reason it, it was famous because it could do long-term visionary research, but it was also a company that produced telephones. And the reason they could do that long-term research was because they charged everybody's phone call a couple of cents, and they captured that for research and development. So, so you saw the progression. Academia did it in the beginning, and then it got a little tougher, so government got involved, then industry got involved, but they did it in isolation. Then um, the first computer, the, so then the transistor was kind of being born then, and then it took until 1958, I believe, was when the first transistor was produced, and it took a few more years for IBM to, to come out with the uh, 1060, I think it was. It was the first, they bet the company on this. I mean, this was huge risk for IBM. They put everything into making this kind of computing for companies to use, so a central co processor. And I think it was for payroll or something. It was some fairly straightforward things. And, um, and that was really the birth of the integrated circuit and computing as we saw. And then um, Noyce and uh, Kilby from Texas Instrument and, and Noyce from Intel uh, later took that and, began and developed the actual kind of the first integrated package device and that's really kind of where Intel kind of launched. So again, um, the takeaway there though is it took 40 years from that tri triode tube to turn into the vacuum tube it took just 10 years from the invention of the first transistor into an integrated circuit that in was in a deployed computing system, maybe 12 years. So what you're seeing is not only the evolution of technology, but you're seeing that as it goes through different technology models, academia, government, industry, it's accelerating its, the conversion from innovation into commercial success. Now, flash forward to today. Actually, 2001, exactly. That was really the beginning of nanotechnology. It was really 1998, uh, President Clinton put out the National Nanotechnology Initiative. It was the first time nano was really used. Um, and it began to focus the nation on preparing itself to capture nanotechnology because it was viewed as the driver for the next industrial revolution. Now. But nanotechnology, it has a lot of challenges. It's expensive, it's complex, it requires a different kind of model. So what I'm going to talk about today is that next iteration of the technology model from academia to government to industry to now one where all three come together, academia, government, and industry together co-located in a shared use facility. And then I would like to talk about how that strategy that New York State, New York State, not the federal government, the New York State drove and has driven for the last uh, 15 years has, is now being um, focused to replicate that approach but adapt it for the unique uh, skills and attributes that the Mohawk Valley region has. 
so that we can take and capture more of the economic value of nanotechnology. So what I have, uh, so I got to use up my time and talk about nanoeconomics. So if anybody wants to study nanoeconomics, that's one of the flavors that you would study is technology development models and the strategies to mitigate risk and accumulate the capital necessary to commercialize, develop, and commercialize nanotechnology. Because if it is the driver for the next industrial revolution, which almost all nations have agreed to, then it will change almost every facet of our lives. Just as the iPhone has changed your day-to-day -day interactions now with your children, with your employer, with your uh, family and, and friends, it is going to change the way you do your job, whether it be in healthcare, in transportation, in energy, in education. So with that, um, I titled this Pioneering Innovation to Drive an Educational and Economic Renaissance in New York State. And so I, what I thought I would do is spend a few slides to really talk about the 21st century challenge and opportunity, both the business and economic trends, before we get, kind of get into any of the uh, nuts and bolts, talk about the New York State investment strategy, which has been this technology hub manufacturing node model that we're uh, establishing across the state. And then I just, let's, what have we accomplished in the first 10 years? What, you know, what's, what's uh, uh, happened so far? And then let's drill down specifically in to the uh, Mohawk Valley focus, this cross-regional technology transition capability. And then if we have time, I've got an example to kind of crystallize it for you in the area of smart transportation and then my own concluding thoughts. That sounds good. So what are the uh, nanotechnology business and economic trends? Um, I'm going to step out here a little bit so I can uh, slow. I'm afraid to push it too much because then it'll start to, uh, OK. On a typical day somewhere in the world, because you might wonder, geez, is nanotechnology really affecting my life? Looks pretty idyllic. I'd say that's Germany, just chosen by the architecture. Test one, two. Yeah. Wonderful. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, so here you can see it's, it's, it's in not only the computer that's in the laptop, it's in the display, the light emitting device display at the bottom, the magnetics. So what I'm identifying are materials here. And these materials have different properties. Certainly magnet magnetism we're all familiar with, photons for light emitting, you know, lights and, and things like that. Um, you have battery storage, biocompatible polymers, so now you're getting into the biomedical area. Janet Palou is going to talk about that a little bit, I think, later um, from our faculty in the bio, our bio faculty. Um, batteries, uh, wireless communication, the saw structure over there, that's an uh, antenna. So what is nanotechnology? Well, really, it's encompassing a wide range of disciplines. Nanotechnology involves imagining, measuring, modeling, and manipulating matter at the nanoscale. And what happens at the nanoscale is that you have very different fundamental uh, properties of the materials than what they would have in the bulk form. So for example, copper is a conductor. It's heavy. It's malleable. In the nano form, it might have very different properties. It might be an insulator. If combined with a certain material, it would be an insulator. It might fluoresce if you shined it on a, with a fluorescent light at a certain wavelength, depending on the size of the molecule. So in many ways, I uh, like to think of it as a huge toolbox. Oops. Better? Thanks. I like to think of it as a, a <laughs> hey. My, I like to think of it as a huge toolbox. Um, to solve a lot of the problems that we're confronting in a variety of applications, whether it be computer chips or clean energy or transportation. Um, let's see what happens here. I think it snoozes. Oh, wait. Maybe I shine it. So nanofabrication technology is the, considered the driver for the next industrial revolution. 
And really what drives that is scaling or shrinking the size of the integrated circuits, aka the ICs, um, and the broadening of the materials used uh, results in ever greater number of ICs and related functions. So what you start to see is as, you, as we keep progressing, you're seeing sensing, photonics, biologics, uh, fluidics, wireless, mechanical, and silicon manufacturing infrastructure will enable this innovation. So the tools that are developed for computer chips can be used for a lot of different things. Specifically, what we would like to, I think, focus in on today on the here and now is really enabling the smart system. So think of embedded power, wireless, logic and memory, sensing, actuation and positioning technologies. And when you combine those, you can kind of see the progression here. Broadband and wireless communication. Location-based services, thus the iPhone, right? I'm here, where's the restaurant? Where, where's my train schedule, whatever? Um, and, and that data resides in the cloud. So now you're starting to see the device interacting with some, this, this notion of connectivity and data residing in the cloud. Then when you add, start to add situational awareness to this, so knowing, looking at things, positioning you, don't bump into each other, infrared imaging to understand, see what's in the night. Now you're looking at smart defense, smart transportation. And then finally, the last progression for the, I think the real pot of gold for many industrial partners is personalized healthcare, where you're really looking at, at um, wearing your, your analysis, your d drug delivery, having that real-time uh, uh, control. Oh, there we go. So I'd like to put up, we talked about the smartphone. Wolf mentioned it at the beginning. I thought that was a great intro. Smartphone revolution. And I'd like to point out that it's really an enabling technology platform iPhone was just launched in 2007. Seems like it's been around forever, but it just was 2007. And what was interesting is, uh, it's down here, okay. Um, it initially used triangulation off towers to give you your position. And, you know, as a result, just from that, you had, well, I think we're over 500,000 apps in the Apple iStore. I know there's 2 billion app downloads or 4 billion app downloads, it's some huge amount. But the takeaway is that by 2010, the price for a GPS chip w came down to $2.50, replaced the triangulation approach. And so what it really means is that the smartphone platform accelerates the product through the volume production curve if it can be fabricated in silicon. Use this existing know-how and factories that are out there and you can bring, dramatically lower the cost for devices that are mass produced using this infrastructure. So now you start to think about, okay, right now it's in the consumer sector. If we can add sensors for biomonitoring, for healthcare, for location of your parcels and your car and your trains for better utilization of that infrastructure, now you can start to avoid a whole bunch of infrastructure capital costs by just using what you already have more efficiently. So, why, you know, do we need this new model, this new technology development model of bringing private, pub, public, industry, university, government together? Well, it's helpful when you start to understand the, the pieces to that total puzzle in delivering or enjoying the benefits of smart technology. And what you see is it first begins with nanotechnology, and that's enabled the, the logic and memory. That little, com the brain that's in our smartphone is the equivalent of what was in a supercomputer about five to seven years ago. And that's why it can chomp away and do all kinds of functions instantly because if we had to wait 10 seconds for something to happen, people wouldn't use it. It would, you know, it, even that, that little delay would be too long. We need instantaneous. But then we started to add data or sensors to this phone, right? The camera in your phone, the accelerometer in your phone, I mean, the microphone in your phone. That's how we got 500,000 apps, was just from three or four sensors, the GPS in your phone. Those four little sensors created a half a million apps. But now you can start to add more sensors to that, and now you can start to focus moving from the consumer smartphone to smart transportation, smart healthcare. Of course, you need to start dealing with the cloud computing, and if you're going to run data over that, secure data, you're going to want cybersecurity becomes very important. So now you start to see, gee, what do you have in the Mohawk Valley? 
I think it's uh, it was North America's Cyber Security Center, I believe. What is the history of Mohawk Valley? It's all of these. This is your DNA right here. Then you move into field uh, level design and engineering. That's where you start to think about, okay, I'm gonna put it into a subway uh, system, I'm gonna put it on a road highway, I'm gonna put it in a smart building, I'm gonna put it in the, in the battle theater. Uh, and then finally it's gonna lead to this transformational hybrid systems. So what you're seeing there is one feeds into the next, that then feeds into the cybersecurity, and then finally, um, in the end, it, it, it is bringing us into the opportunity for transformational growth. And what New York State strategy is designing to do is capture as much of that value chain as possible. So, the smart systems technology economy, the changing role of regions in the next industrial revolution. Well, this is a little background, changing nature of innovation. And so what we've plotted is how long did it take for each technology to penetrate or spread to a quarter of the country? And you can see the automobile, it took a little 55 years. Um, the radio, around 20 years. Internet took about five. So the, 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 the world is faster, collaborative, democratized, and global. But nanoscale fabrication requires this closer coupling between R&D and manufacturing. It's very unforgiving. You can imagine a molecule gets out of alignment in your production process, suddenly things don't work anymore. So you've gotta be far more um, focused. And it also requires bringing together physics and chemistry, engineering, material science, biology, and yes, even economics, because it's changing the, the business or the game of which you're gonna pay for this. Um, another uh, kind of an emerging economic growth theory is, uh, came out uh, several years ago under the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology uh, in the Sustaining the Nation's Innovation Ecosystems, and they characterized the IT industry as R&D Manufacturing Innovation Ecosystem. And it, so that if you lose either one, either R&D or manufacturing, you lose the whole ecosystem. So this notion that it's okay to do invention here and ship it off to China, for manufacturing, you're gonna eventually lose your innovation, your R&D capability, because nanotechnology requires this closer coupling. It will ultimately drag that research and development with it to the manufacturing sites. So it calls for a strong support for university R&D. It suggests maybe a next generation Bell Labs model. It talks about improved workforce education. It talks about having pre-approved sites, shovel-ready sites. Boy, it sounds like they were looking at what New York State was doing. This was written in 2005. New York started doing all of this in 2002. Um, competitive tax policies, I would, the yeah, Empire Development Zone, for example, right? We've, um, coordinate federal and state R&D programs. That's what's somewhat been lacking over the years. And I think it's the handheld, yeah. So re measuring regional um, innovation. Council on Competitiveness Guidebook uh, it came out in 2005. I apologize. And they talk about a paradox that even as the globalized um, community, technology world has globalized, the role of regions as a critical nexus for an innovation-based economic growth has increased. Kind of counterintuitive. But it talks about the need for proximity for a region, diversification, and differentiation of your region. And then it talks about re regional innovation drivers, networks, culture, and then assets, and these are those assets, R&D institutions, human capital, financial capital, industrial base, physical infrastructure, quality of life. And when you start to look at what well, as we go through the New York State strategy, you're gonna see a ticking off of the list here, one by one. Mm. Okay, here we go. So the New York State investment strategy, a technology hub manufacturing node model. Kind of busy, but it really looks at, think of it at the top as input, or, and then the targeted outcomes at the bottom. And so what we look at are targeted public-private partnerships, tailored workforce development, and shared facilities and shovel-ready sites. And with that, the goal is to create a nanotechnology open innovation ecosystem, R&D and manufacturing ecosystem. 
And the outcomes, we're looking at the, R, the three different phases of commercializing innovation. The R&D phase, the pilot prototype demonstration phase, the manufacturing scale-up phase. And each one has its own cluster of companies. So the R&D phase, the startup, right? That's the incubators. That's what everybody has long positioned themselves to grow the next Microsoft. But the pilot prototype, now you're relevant to the supply chain. Now you can bring in the companies that want to try out their next solution in the manufacturing line, so supplier growth. And then finally, manufacturing scale up. Now you're feeding right into the factories. And again, nanotechnology needs this closer coupling between R&D and manufacturing. So if they have a problem, they can run right back into the labs to solve it. So let's start off with the first three inputs, targeted public-private partnerships. This is just kind of a timeline of the highlights. Um, you know, we started back in 97 with a, a single building, co-location. Sounds familiar, I think, uh, is what we're talking about here. We uh, had, uh, were selected by the Semiconductor Industry Association for an R&D center. And then the partnerships with IBM, Semitech, Tokyo Electron, ASML, each one hundreds of millions of dollars of investment for co-location and establishing a shared use infrastructure. Finally, the, the true highlight was the partnership with SUNY IT in 2010. And that one, you know, with, with the speaker uh, Silver announced, and um, we also, he also announced one in uh, Syracuse, a partnership with the Center State CEO, Lockheed Martin, partnership with Smart Systems Technology Commercialization Center in Rochester. So you're beginning to see this broadening, this hub, technology hub node aspect being developed. But then also, finally, the, um, uh, a few other later developments that I'm going to go into in just a minute. Um, tailored workforce development. I've kind of summarized this because in the afternoon we're going to hear a lot more about education and workforce, so I'm not going to go into that. But my takeaway that I want you to take away is engagement, enrichment, and education. Engagement, get the kids exposed to STEM. Let them see what the careers are going to be like. These are like nano career days where we'll bring 13 buses of kids from high schools through the complex all day long. They're looking into the clean rooms. They're seeing what their college life is going to be like. They're going to see what their work life is going to be like. Then enrichment. These are shorter term activities. Um, the one with Albany High School is, is throughout the year. Uh, we're getting ready to um, launch one with Girls Inc. that is a five year commitment by uh, the parents of these girls from, uh, we're going to start off with Albany, and that's a five-year commitment to go through summer programming in STEM, so directly uh, to what, what Congressman was uh, focusing on. And then you can have short-term summer institutes. We've done one program with um, uh, uh, at-risk students from, not only from Albany, Schenectady, Troy, but we've d done one last year with um, Newburgh, and these are kids that the system has given up on, and we've brought them in, and by the time they leave, they are uh, giving PowerPoint presentations and, and participating. And then finally, education. Um, again, it's the, the fir world's first college to provide a, a PhD uh, and master's degree in nanotechnology. We're very proud that in the last, we're in our fourth semester now of undergraduate nanotechnology education. But we have partnerships in the trades, uh, with the trade unions, with M&W Group, uh, of course with the community colleges, and of course now, the partnership with SUNY IT, which is, I would say, more into the full, you know, MS, BA, BS, MS, PhD level. Shared integration facilities. Um, sh I'm not going to spend a lot of time other than to say there's 80,000 square feet of 300 millimeter clean room. Um, if you were to add up the amount of 300 millimeter clean room at other universities around the world, it would be zero. So we are kind of have a, uh, a unique position there. Uh, we have around 2,600 people on site. Um, probably about 700 of them are CNSC employees or faculty and students. The rest are from industry. Um, and we're, uh, uh, I would say it's a, an amazing place. If you haven't come, please, we'll, we'll be having more visits scheduled in the future, and, and I welcome to have you there. Um, what you see, though, is an open innovation ecosystem, that R&D ecosystem that we talked about, with small companies, with integrated device manufacturers, the equipment suppliers, material suppliers, 
and indus even industry consortia um, and, and other companies uh, from around the world. The, uh, and, and remember what I was talking about that it's, it's driving this closer coupling between R&D and manufacturing, but it's also speeding up the development clock, the time. For, you can't take 10 years to, to wait for innovation to turn into commercial success. You really need to compress that into three years, three to four or five years. Um, the sharing of the investment, the cost is going through the roof. I mean, we're at $14 billion of investment at the college now. The reason it's so expensive is because we're also doing, you know, industry scale R&D on industry scale operations. And then finally, leveraging the partner know-how. There's too many pathways to pursue for a possible solution. So you need to bring in the, ac the academic researchers as well as the supply chain. All right, there we go. So phase one, the first 10 years, success to date. Well, the three phases, I talked about R&D, pilot prototyping, manufacturing scale up. Um, this is what we do. We take that, all the research going on in the industry and we begin to convert that into deployed solutions in the various fabs um, in, around the world. What we're doing now is we're broadening the materials that we can now integrate into these CMOS logic. CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. It's kind of the standard approach to making chips for the last 25 years. And uh, we're now adding functionality. These materials bring more function sensing capability to your devices. And so the hub, again, started at Albany. But it really was feeding from the very beginning, transitioning that research into manufacturing and additional investment by IBM down in Fishkill. Um, it was also uh, focusing a lot of our partners over at the Waterville Arsenal Technology Park. That's where they build the cannons. It was the, it's the oldest arsenal in the country. And our thought was, if you can turn around this facility that's being you know, closed down, then you can, you can replicate this model anywhere. And then finally, the attraction of Global Foundries up at Luther Forest, the first Greenfield 300 millimeter fab built in the United States um, since the 300 millimeter generation started. So, as I said, IBM's built several fab expansions, 300 millimeter chip fab expansions, and Global Foundries, of course, now six and a half billion. I think they've announced even another investment to expand even more. Um, the water really at Arsenal, though, is very interesting. Here, what did we had at the Arsenal? We had a lot of uh, skilled trade. We had a secure site. We had a focus on defense. So we f our first company we brought in was M&W Group, uh, based in Stuttgart, Germany. They're one of the two companies in the world that know how to build chip fabs. And uh, the New York State Assembly provided funding to set up a uh, workforce training facility over at the Arsenal for the trade to elevate their skill level so that they could work in the nanotechnology field. And as you can see, they're gowned up just like you are in the clean room. They have to learn how to use microscopes to verify their welds, don't have any leaks. I mean, again, nanotechnology requires this level of sophistication. But VizTech lithography, they build these tools down here at the bottom. And these are lithography tools, and they were based over in Cambridge, England. They've moved their whole company, manufacturing and R&D, manufacturing over at the Arsenal, R&D over at the college. And prior to this, no U.S. company made e-beam tools. And guess what? The Defense Department uses a, a lot of these for their devices. So um, it was a win for the Army. It was a win for the United States. It was a win for our region, and it was uh, certainly a win for um, the, uh, the company. And this is uh, the uh, picture, now it's all already done. Every site over at the Arsenal is now full. We have no more available space over there. I think there's 30 or 35 different high-tech companies over there now. Recent accomplishments, New York State Governor uh, Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo, announced the Global 450 Consortia. So the semiconductor industry builds computer chips on 300 millimeter wafers today. They're now preparing to progress to the 450 millimeter wafer. That's a huge challenge for the industry. They spend billions of dollars, and Governor Cuomo announced the uh, $4.8 billion program. 
um, with $400 million pledged by New York State. And th that brought in Intel and Taiwan Semiconductor, which is TSMC, which were the only missing companies we had in the ecosystem. So we now have all of the world's semiconductor companies, leading semiconductor companies, doing their research in Alden. But it's this, the beauty of this was that it is focused on ex 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 investments across the state to support this effort. And uh, there we go. We also were awarded by the Department of Energy a $57.5 million grant uh, to the Nano College in partnership with Semitech to create the nation's first U.S. photovoltaic manufacturing consortium. And this is one that is coming up with many, many partners. Um, in fact, I think Indium is going to be participating here later tomorrow or today, uh, this afternoon, and is a member of that. Um, the recent accomplishments, again, uh, our partnership with the uh, facility out in Rochester, what they do is they make MEMS, or micro electromechanical systems. So think of the electronic nose or tongue, eye, ear in a sensing arena. That's kind of a simpler way to look at it. But many of the things in your, the microphone in your, in your smartphone, it's not a little, it, it's an electronic device. Um, the camera, it's an electronic device. That's why you get, you know, I don't know how many pixels that these cameras have. But that's why you can bring down the cost so much. Um, but you can also make pumps for bio, this is a little uh, biofluidic mixing, <coughs> mixing agents right here. You got a little mixing chamber and each reactant is brought in, blood samples brought in. Um, this is for fluidics uh, channeling, optical arrays. Um, and again, these are all uh, kinds of devices that are going to enable smart defense, smart cities, smart energy. The announcement just last week was that the Department of Defense certified our facility as a trusted foundry, which means we can now do a whole bunch of defense work. It's now only us and Sandia that are the two trusted MEMS foundries in the nation. Um, and then, of course, we, with all of that, we've had to expand our hub, our technology hub. And this is our, our expansion right here, uh, what we call Nanofab X. Um, and X will be uh, including the Global 450 Consortia, but also a extreme ultraviolet lithography uh, center, more 300 millimeter technology. Um, and then the second phase of the project will include uh, nanobio, silicon photonics, the US PV manufacturing consortia. Um, and the STC facility, this is a picture of that Rochester facility I was talking about that where the MEMS devices are done, are set up and is actually also running compound semiconductors or 3.5 devices. So what's the economic impact to date? Well, the college works with over 300 industry partners, including electronics, energy defense, and biohealth. We're at $14 billion of investment, over 2,700 R&D jobs currently on site, projected to 3,700 when our new building opens. Um, since 2001, we've created or retained 12,500 jobs across the state, 1 billion in wages, 28 billion in, in investment, uh, global, global, uh, IBM, Endicott Interconnect across the state. Projected by 2015, we'll be at 25,000 jobs created and retained and 2.25 billion in wages. So let's now drill into the uh, Mohawk Valley region. I've got enough time here, I think, to spend some. Uh, so um, I think it's helpful to look at the strategy that we've been employing because it really is starting to focus on a federal, on a state-federal partnership. So I'm really glad Congressman Hanna is here because this is uh, very important, very helpful to understand that the relationship can be very positive in a variety of ways. So when you look at the progression of technology, it kind of goes through, and this is cash flow on the left, and you, the red line is how much cash is needed to fund an activity. And so in the R&D phase, cash flow is you know, relatively low, right? That's why startup companies can kind of live on credit cards and contributed money from angel investors. But then when you start to move into the pilot prototype phase and then into the manufacturing phase, now you can see how that cost goes up and the risk goes up. So what the strategy that we're deploying across the state is to really focus in on these different phases 
for the focus activity of our uh, of each uh, participant, e each uh, uh, region. So again, the Albany Hub. Um, there we go. If I can get it. Battery might be getting a little low. Uh, that's our uh, STC facility, our partnership with um, Center State CEO and Lockheed Martin in Syracuse, and uh, of course our partnership here today. So what are the strategies? Well, for each of the regions, we're targeting kind of, not necessarily technologies, we're targeting unique aspects. Our ability to go after tr defense trusted foundry uh, activity, our ability to, to process devices on various sizes of wafers. One of the challenges in the industry is kind of each node is kind of locked in its place. So if you can help companies to transition to the larger wafers, the cost goes down, markets open up. Um, we're also able to do a one-stop lab to the fab to the field. So you know, R&D manufacturing ecosystem, so you can take innovation and move it right into production. And then as I talked about new materials entering this process line, integrating them onto the existing standard process flows um, in the uh, industry. So now if we kind of go back to the New York State strategy for the Mohawk Valley and tailor it in, now we're looking at shared integration, co-location facilities, tailored workforce training, shovel-ready technology parks. The Quad C CAP building is really the facility that's going to house these three or enable these three activities. And we're going to be focusing in on three targeted outcomes, cloud computing, nanoelectronics clean rooms, lab testing laboratories for the supply chain. So back to that bo box we had before. You're seeing how the, the quad C is the linkage between our two institutions. And of course, what we're looking at here, R&D education workforce training at SUNY IT, the quad C, both being able to host on-site partners for their activities, as well as interacting with the faculty and students for their, to get their workforce, but al also concurrently focusing on the large manufacturing full volume production um, out in uh, across the road over at the Marcy Nano Center site. And of course, uh, the focus again, Quad C ex uh, extends the CNSE co-location model with the Fort Schuyler Management Corporation, focusing on commercialization clean rooms for multifunctional devices, cloud computing, cybersecurity, and nanofabrication supply chain development and testing. Uh, first company that was announced was Infrastructure. Now, Infrastructure, like its name, similar to Infrastructure, but it is a company that is a leading cloud computing design, build, and operation uh, company. It is IBM's uh, number one uh, premier business partner. Um, when Global Foundries wanted to connect its operations in Saratoga with its operations in Singapore, in Dresden and California, they turned to infrastructure to do that. When Google was building their new building down in New York City and they needed someone to, again, set up their connectivity, they turned to infrastructure. Infrastructure, based in Clifton Park, it's actually a local, it's a New York State company, has established its uh, Western New York uh, headquarters here at the SUNY IT CAT Quad C building. Um, and will be focusing on extending cloud from beyond the Fortune 100 companies that have it and are using it to smart healthcare, smart governmental services, smart higher ed, smart all of the small business. So think of the opportunities for growth and that capturing the value chain as much as possible. And of course, workforce is a key element of that. And cybersecurity will become a key element of that, too. Um, and then, of course, value tech. We've got Greg Hyland is going to be the moderator at one of the, the uh, panels this afternoon. Um, value tech is the global leader in, in contamination control. So again, remember I talked about nanotechnology is very unforgiving. Well, it's pushing the envelope on the ability for the human to, in, to come into these clean environments. 
and, and also to maintain the protocols in place to minimize contamination of particulate onto whatever product you're making. And when you start to think about bringing biological world in with the computer chip world, now you can start to see this complexity of being able to handle bio and physical, you know, organic and inorganic, and um, to do that in a, uh, uh, to, to progress with the industry as it progresses into a variety of new markets and opportunities. So establishing its headquarters here, product manufacturing, quality control testing, inventory control facilities for current products, but also concurrently setting up a contamination control research development testing lab um, as well to uh, develop its next generation products is critically important to its growth. So now when you look back at the kind of the, the connections here, you can see a little bit and have a better appreciation for the types of companies that are coming in are fitting into a very uh, focused strategy, if you will, that is, in my, I, I see, as the uh, core of which our nation will compete in the 21st century. So let's give it an example. I think I've got a few minutes. Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, case in point, smart transportation. Well, let's see how that. So here's a good one. Ever, do you, do everybody download the smart beer application? Wolf? Wolf did. OK. Anybody else? No? Well, that's, that's my favorite, but uh, maybe smart wine application, you can drink it. No DWI problem there, right? Um, but you know, the same thing, and the reason how that works is something called an accelerometer. And it can tell you, orient your screen, that's why it knows when it turns this way, it kind of changes back around. But as you can start to, you can also use it in this case, streetscape layering application. So as you rotate your screen around, it can start to bring up data related to whatever it is you're looking at. Um, so if you look at a microelectromechanical system, one of those devices that are made out in our Rochester facility, um, uh, and I should say Cornell's facility, which we have a, a guest here from Cornell, um, the, uh, th you can make gyroscopes. So this will give you your XY, your accelerometer. It'll give you how far you're going. You put the two together. You now have an opportunity to uh, deploy it for uh, embedded parcel intelligence. So where in the building is the parcel? Not just what, you know, what street is it on through GPS, but let's, oh, and also I'd throw in GPS in that device so it could uh, know, know pretty much where you are um, on the globe. And then, but you're going to start to embed it on infrastructure to evaluate vibration in the bridges for overweight trucks, for failing infrastructure, for a variety of different things. And then ultimately put it on trains so that they can run in closer proximity. And you would think GPS would do that already. I guess when it's, it becomes a problem when the trains are side by side in a yard. Now suddenly GPS can't tell which train is which. So when you look at this, you're kind of looking at um, kind of, again, the wireless communication, the geopositioning, the positive vehicle control. Lockheed Martin actually has a group out in Buffalo that works on this. Um, our partnership with the MTA to apply this for transit. Um, infrastructure for man maintaining the data in the cloud that's going to be related to all of this. And, and this is just the beginning. Transportation hasn't rolled out yet. These are yet markets yet to be conquered. But you're already reading about Google having cars drive themselves across the country, right? So they're doing it in different ways. They're probably doing it with optical sensing, but th it's fast, it's coming quickly. So in concluding thoughts, um, I'd like to close. This is a uh, article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal back in August of last year. And it talked about um, uh, where the action is across the country and talking about these clusters these ecosystems, if you will. I particularly like the one, I think it was in, where's beer? Yeah, beer down in uh, North Carolina. I thought that was kind of a nice one. But uh, up in Albany, New York, they have nanotechnology um, with uh, backing from corporations and the state. This town's um, university base expanded and became a haven for nanotechnology startups, well, as well as global leaders in the uh, semiconductor industry. Um, and then I'd like to close. This is an interesting slide. I took it from uh, Carlotta Perez's book, 
published in 2002 called Technological Revolution and Financial Capital. And I, I really, I like this book because it gets into the economics and it puts it in context of where are we within, you know, the uh, global opportunity for technology and growth. And it maps out the different industrial revolutions, the age of steam. Um, I kind of skipped over the Bronze Age. That was a little earlier. But what's interesting is what she's, what she's asserting is that the technology gets erupts or it gets uh, established, and then it, it grows. It, 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 it builds wealth. And then there's a financial collapse. Always happens. So you create all this wealth, and she posits that it, it's driven by this technology uh, industrial revolution. Crash happens, and then there's a trigger. And that trigger leads to a sustained growth period, a time of um, the, what's also known as the plateau of productivity. And what I kind of put in here is, this is my own thought, I, I really view the iPhone, the Apple iPhone launch in 2007 as that trigger. Because certainly we know about the crash in 2008, right? That, now suddenly manufacturing is hot. Everybody cares about that. Real estate doesn't matter anymore in, in all the, the, uh, the wheeling dealing. Now it's, it's that. And so I, I would posit that smart energy, smart health care, smart transportation, all of this is yet to happen. And I think New York State, and particularly this region, is well positioned to participate and capture a great deal of the value related to this uh, next generation technology, and also position our nation to compete globally um, because of we really see ourselves as a national resource uh, for companies around the country. So with that, I'll close my remarks, and I look forward to the afternoon's uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Oh. Hey, thanks. That's a military thing. I, it is. It is. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so uh, I think there's a one little error uh, that uh, the slide that Mike showed you about the beer in North Carolina. You know that uh, Mohawk Valley ought to be renamed the beer cap, well, beer microbrew capital of the United States. We have the second oldest brewery right here, FX Map Brewing Company, not that far behind Yinling, but, and you know, we have other wonderful breweries coming up like Omegang, and so we ought to be the microbrew capital of the world. But anyway, so basically what we did was uh, we put this uh, nanotechnology forum together for you and we want you to be part of this uh, wave of uh, excitement behind Nano here in the Mohawk Valley. As Nano and its allied technologists come to Mohawk Valley, we want you to be our partners in attracting and growing this technology industry with us. That was the whole rationale behind putting this first forum, and there will be many more like this. To help facilitate this event, we have, uh, we will follow the general s this general session with three concurrent sessions. And uh, I know that you're interested in, you probably be, are interested in attending more than one session. Don't worry, we're taping all the concurrent sessions and we'll put them on our uh, website. So you can actually view them at your leisure. So what I, uh, uh, now also, when you came in, uh, on your seat, there's a little, um, you know, one that looks like uh, this, you know, yeah, one of those. Um, because uh, these are the, uh, I know all of you who um, you carry your iPads, iPhones, and some Blackberries. We're sorry about that. Um, that you probably need a little bit of cleansing. So the nanofibers on this will sure to pick up all the contamination. And I heard uh, Greg uh, Highland of Value Tech will be testing these wipes for us. Uh, so we appreciate that. Just let us know uh, at our next uh, Nano Forum uh, the effectiveness of these uh, uh, these wonderful wipes. So there will be three sessions. Nanotech 101 is intended for K through 12 educators and also general public who may just want to find out a little bit more about what nanotechnology is. And uh, that session will be led by two of our faculty members. One is uh, uh, John Marsh, who is associate professor of uh, computer science, but he is actually a, um, 
he's a home girl, I mean, he's a really a physicist, so he, he knows what he's talking about. And uh, with him uh, is Jan Palo, and she is an associate professor of nanobioscience at CNSC. The second session, uh, that session will be held in the theater upstairs. So uh, if you just go up the stairs, go all the way down to the uh, end, you're gonna see the theater and it's really nice seating, much more comfortable than these chairs. So uh, it's actually good. And the second session is nanotech for academics and that is intended for our uh, college students and college faculty. And that session will be led by Mike, uh, Mike uh, Scavrala from Cornell University. And basically he's going to talk about how uh, faculty and students can be, uh, can work together with our uh, industrial facilities like uh, uh, the one that we're building and how uh, various entities can support faculty and student research and learning. So I think that will be an in interesting session um, as well. And then the third is the uh, nanotechnology, nanotech for business. It's a, uh, 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 basically moderated session. Uh, Greg Hyland, president and CEO, CEO of Value Tech will be moderating that session. Uh, and the two uh, guest uh, panelists are Andy uh, Mackey from uh, Indium Corporation, uh, and which is a, a phenomenal uh, materials uh, corporation here in Utica. And also uh, Terry I'm gonna, uh, Rogelstad, uh, from, uh, he's, he's from Pfeiffer Vacuum Incorporated. So uh, we look, really look forward to those two sessions. The nanotech for uh, academics session, the second session, will be held on the other side of this wall. And then the nanotech for business will be right here in this, this room. Uh, from 2.30 to, two, uh, so we actually have, uh, okay, so we're gonna give you a 15 minute uh, uh, break so you can do your thing. And uh, we'll, uh, the, Sessions will run from 2.30 to 4.15. And at 4.15, I'm going to ask everybody to come back to this, uh, this room. And we'll uh, have our closing remarks. And also, uh, before we leave, uh, I would like us to have a, a plan of action, how Mohawk Valley, how we can really uh, embrace this nanotechnology, nanoscience, and nano fever of what we're gonna do next. What are our next steps? And we want your input and your um, help in, as we construct our CAT and Quad C. That's CAT, Computer uh, uh, Center for Advanced Technology, Quad C, Computer Chip Commercialization Center, okay? Also, uh, we're not gonna uh, bore you with a written uh, feedback form, but later, uh, because uh, if you could uh, send in your uh, suggestions, comments, what else would you like to see in this nanotech forum once we, ha we have part two coming uh, in the fall. We're gonna combine this with uh, uh, SUNY IT President's lecture series, and we're gonna bring in some uh, scholars and practitioners from outside. Uh, what would you like to see? And we'd like to hear from you. And so send us that uh, comment through our registration website that you, where you all registered, and we'll do our best to uh, get those uh, speakers uh, to get us more informed and to help move us forward in this uh, nano venture, okay? So uh, Nanotech 101, the theater, Nanotech for uh, the academics, the other room, and Nanotech for business in this room. So we'll see you back here at 4.15. Thank you.